Cool. Welcome back. Um, my name is Patrick Pennyfather, and uh, to begin with, I'd like to do just a, a small experiment. So I need a, a couple of uh, people to help me because I've developed this new application using the Go, which uh, senses, uh, it, 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 it's basically it senses where objects are in the room. And uh, if you don't believe me, then I'll demonstrate. Um, I just need, there's a, there's a couple of little things that I need. First of all, it, it's always helpful when a friend uh, and colleague calls you for emotional support. So if we can engage the friend to call any moment, that would be great. Cool. Anytime. <laughs> Oh, do you, yes, thank you, Bernard. And uh, do we do we have the speakerphone activated? Cool. Can we have the voice activated on the speakerphone? Okay, cool. So let's bring let's. You might have to adjust the volume on the phone and just turn it up a little bit because that's going to be key 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 here. Today I'm going to talk about uh, the new MR. And I'm not going to reveal the acronym just yet. So let's demonstrate a little bit of the new MR. And, and this is all based on an experience I had last summer with a lot of amazing people on an amazing project that was completely out of scope. And yes, Julianne, it failed. But in a great, <laughs> great way. So let's begin. And uh, Prop Master. Oh, I really enjoy calling you that. <laughs> One time I'll be proud. Okay, here we go. Uh, emotional support from friend on phone? No, virtually on phone. No, on phone. Virtually. Are we on speaker phone? Hello? Hi, we're here. Oh, they're calling. And can you put You're on speaker. speaker. Cool. cool. So, hi, who is this? Yeah, okay, Yangos. Everyone say hi, Yangos. Patrick. Right. Cool. Okay, so Yangos, you're going to guide me a little bit uh -huh. um, to pick up objects in the virtual world that are also simultaneously in the physical world, and thus making this a mixed reality experience. Here we go. Where? Forward? Back, forward. <laughs> Success? No. <laughs> yeah. So thanks to the technology. Thanks to Yangos and thanks to uh, Propmaster Rosati. <laughs> and, and can I have my phone back? Yeah. Thanks. Can you grab this? Can you rub my shoulder? Okay. <laughs> I might have pushed it a little too far. Yeah, feel free. Um, so, originally, when Rosati asked me to present today, I started to think of the reflection of a mixed reality event uh, that I co-organized and produced. Why am I holding two mics? Uh, <laughs> last summer. And this was part of my reflection. Bear with me, and luckily none of the students that were working on the project at the time at the Master of Digital Media program are here, but I think you'll all resonate with this, especially being theater creators who take care of the staging. Here we go. It was entitled, Why Didn't Anyone Pick Up a Broom? The Perils of Staging a Public Mixed Reality Event. And I wrote, Perseverance, Compassion, caring, those were my three first words. And I'll repeat those today. On the surface, it's not really fair to expect students to anticipate certain actions to be undertaken prior to them understanding what may come.
This may be true for a team of grad students developing augmented reality applications for a location-specific event. On a mundane level, it may also be as simple as sweeping the floor in a 3,000 square foot hangar. While we may tout that one of the learning points of project-based learning is self-regulation or managing your own learning and being motivated and doing your own thing. And this, by the way, in the research, is what employers expect recent grads to manage once they are transitioned into their companies. What they think is important to learn might not always be what they learn. How do we mentor students to anticipate the unexpected, those parts of a production that are not spelled out? Now, I say this in the context of a mixed reality event because in mixed reality events, we do not know what to expect as much as we try to design those experiences beforehand. And there are, amongst us, many people who are engaged in that act in mixed reality events. Bernard, as an example, uh, and his team at See It, they focus a lot of time on the pre, the during, and the post experience of VR, particularly in public spaces. So today I will give sweeping remarks about mixed reality, and those who are involved in the delicate art of stagecraft will resonate with a lot of these uh, sweeping remarks that I'm about to present. So here's my revised title. I thought to extend it a little bit, um, just to give it more emphasis. And uh, a couple of things when you present, you should never read your slides, so I will. Um, so sweeping remarks about the co-construction of an event that by all measures was composed of so many different types of physical and real world interactions with a focus on considering the audience user experience before, during, and after as to be thusly named, that makes no sense, a carnival of mixed reality, even though I also had to call it the fun palace because a colleague was the one who initially dragged me into it with the calming words, it's just a harmless event, it won't take much time. And so today, publicly, I create a new acronym for mixed reality events. And in fact, I get rid of the word mixed. And what I make this stand for today is managing multiple realities. And this is what I'm going to talk about. And in talking about that, I will relate that back to my initial impulse, which is how do we create in each of us, whether we're students or professionals for many years, how do we create that capacity to think ahead with the intention of making our experiences awesome for audiences, for users, whatever we choose to call this hybrid, as was mentioned earlier by Ian. So for those of you who don't know, the carnival of mixed reality was this. But before there was this, there was this. And there were many versions of this. And this, uh, Samantha, are you in the room? How many versions did we have of this? Probably 15, 20 different floor plans that kept evolving over time because everything did devolve. And this was a three month process. No, hang on, what am I saying? Six week process, yeah, that's closer, in order to get to this point. So before there was this, there were some mistakes made. There was this. And there was this photo shoot in order to record people. And there were these first iterations of what would be considered to go into the people. Before there was this app, which was an interactive point inside of Curiosity Booth in which actors would roam around the space to gather people into and secretly have a one-on-one -on -one engagement with an, with an actor. Before there was this or this, Hector, he's here, he uh, created this application. There was this, we had to put it somewhere and this room was a storage room. There was also Laura's hard work to create the window through which the audience member could actually see the actor. And uh, Laura, are you here? I think she left temporarily, but um, yeah, at, there were asbestos signs everywhere. 
And before there was that, there was also this. This was a little friend. I think it had a name. Rachel, do you remember the name that was happening around the time for our little visitor? Benji. Yeah, this was our Benji friend. And uh, Benji visited, and this was three days before. So yes, you can imagine me going, you know, I, I could have just let it go and <laughs> literally brushed it under a carpet. But my concern was for people coming to this event in which a small creature might have alarmed them or remnants of. So these little things, when you're trying to uh, co-produce an event in a space that's not really used to the rigor of what those in theater uh, are used to calling stagecraft. We had a grid that I'll talk about in a moment, and that grid uh, had a certain weight bearing. So before there was this work by Julianne and Small Stage, and Lisa's there too, hi. Before, uh, there, was, there was all this work to set it up. Originally, it was going to be in a geodesic dome, but we changed our mind. We, we also started to play with uh, uh, different lighting scenarios. This was a photo shoot. This was part of a, of a larger scale uh, event that Small Stage was engaged in as artists in, res in residence at the Center for Digital Media. So before there was all that glamour, there was this. Before there was this construction, there was Julianne and I going like, boom, because she thought, wouldn't it be awesome to hang Tyvek off the ceiling? And you can all imagine it, right? It's like, yeah, awesome. But I just about freaked because there was never any weight bearing done on the grid. So Connor, where are you? So you know, I mean, you know, right? It's a risk. So anticipating that, we have to think about, oh, well, what if something falls? That would be bad UX. <laughs> Before there was this, iPad stands uh, with a triggered augmented reality marker triggering a brain. There was the idea that we actually had to have some types of devices for people who didn't want to download an application on their phone. Because that's also an assumption that we make as developers. Oh yeah, I, for sure everyone's going to download my app. For sure, no, actually. So part of thinking about mixed reality events is to consider all these aspects in the design and in the pre-production process. So again, these are just a, uh, beginning photos of it. They, they were eventually were painted black. They were secured it with sandbags. And we had to test and went through a process of testing distance because we wanted to allow people to go in front of it. Oh, right, people are gonna go in front of the camera. What does that mean? We have to put the marker way up high. So we decided to use this piece of scaffolding that's been present in a, and occupying our hangar for a lo uh, the longest period of time. And then we begun a rigorous testing process. That testing process in also involved other colleagues. So Claudia is in one of these photos. And you can see that she is looking at her own brain, which I, I believe is actually that size. We're still not sure how it fits within her head, but you know we, we'll, we'll talk about that another time. But this is actually a, a real brain scan. And so the only way that would have happened is if we had had Claudia as part of the process. So is she a contributor to our mixed reality event? Yes. Are we looking for partnerships? Yes. That's also part of the pre-production process is to, is to look around, to, to seek who else might be willing to participate in whatever capacity. Uh, the students also did AR applications that were uh, in different locations around the space, and these also had to be storyboarded. So we storyboarded almost every possible user experience that occurred in the space. Before there was this, uh, a work by uh, Katerina Stepanova and John, uh, Denway Stewart, uh, students of Bernard, uh, and this is called Gel and it involves uh, reading brainwave data uh, with two people simultaneously, and they are affecting the oscillation rate of two jellyfish. And uh, they're essentially, oh yeah, right, it's, it's synchronized breathing, right? Breathing. Yeah, breathing, thanks Bernard. Glad you're here, doesn't make me nervous at all. Um, <laughs> and so they try, they try to synchronize their breaths so that these two jellyfish eventually end up in synchrony. Well, before there was that, there was, there was a lot of shit that happened. The, uh, the hard drive not working, 
Uh, and one of my favorite shots of the process to share with you is before all of that, there was John at the back of the room soldering the video card, right? Now, for those of us who are used to theater, you might be thinking, yeah, well, whatever, that's what we do. But it's not usually what we do when we're in technology development. There's a lot of assumptions that things are just going to work. And Yangos can attest to that when he and his team, uh, in, including Marcos, who's here, uh, co-constructed a, a, an immensely overscoped and awesome VR theater for SIGGRAPH. They had no technical problems, right? <laughs> so again, another work by the same team from See It, under Bernard's guidance, uh, was the body remixer. And the body remixer consisted uh, of sensing people uh, who were not in VR, along with sensing people who were in VR, creating really a, a, a true mixed reality experience, complementing that virtual and physical uh, aspects of emanations of the human body. And, but before all that, there was Katerina, who was user testing this for at least a week before in the space. And eventually, because you can see here, these are not the lighting conditions, Connor. Eventually, you had to do it in the lighting conditions because that's one of the things that we learn about augmented reality is without the lighting condition, you will not have augmented reality. If it's too dark of a space, it will not trigger anything. So all of these things have to, had to be tested. We also had a piano bar, oh my God. That's what it was called. It was essentially uh, a triggered Unity-based experience, uh, al allowing people who did not know how to play the piano to come up to it, and the sounds were not of the piano at all. Uh, they were synthetic sounds, and it was part of a very, I still don't understand the user journey. But anyway, it was fascinating. The two developers were on it. Uh, but before that all happened, thank God we had Julianne in the room at the time when we decided we need to have another screen. And lo and behold, we have Leo here uh, getting up on the ladder. And yes, he was insured. <clears throat> and, and he was putting that together. And Julianne was helping out. And so we had this whole collaborative process that was part of this mixed reality event. So again, the reason I'm saying all this is that we were, from the beginning, attempting to focus on the user experience, on the audience experience, on that hybrid person that comes in who, for the most part, may or may not engage. That's the risk that we take. Uh, reasons for non-engagement include, I don't want to be seen doing this publicly, for sure. To uh, that lineup is too big. So uh, working with Sam, who's here, yay, and Rachel and others, we had to focus on the lineup experience. How are we going to manage this? And you'll see in, uh, in the video that comes uh, that we taped everything down. I mean, we used strategies of theater in order to help us stage a mixed reality event. We had lighting. We had uh, four speakers with spatial audio. We had a total of, I think, combining with headphones, we had 17 different sources of sound happening simultaneously in the room. We had to consider that. We had to consider levels throughout. Uh, we had a lighting team uh, with Gardner from uh, Simon Fraser University, and she was leading a team to help us design that. All of those things, huge things, in order to enhance the audience experience. Now, it might you might think in theater, I'm gonna ask Connor to put him on the spot because I like putting Connor on the spot, I don't know why. But, but who would have that job of taking care of all of that? Thinking, oh, okay, yeah, we have to think of, of the entire aspect of a production in order to enhance the audience experience. Anyone come to mind? Would it be a technical director? Would it be a producer? Is it a combined role? Is it the director as well? It's a tricky question, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, so, I'm gonna yeah, up, up, what a surprise. It's the entire team. Yeah, yeah. okay. Who's unifying that experience, though, the entire team? Yeah. It's a vision where it comes from. So the vision comes from, does the vision from the producer? Does the vision from the director? The producer means a lot of different words, a lot of details. Yeah. Awesome, so, so you can see, right? <laughs> Just like there's...
So just as there's disagreement in that, there's also disagreement in what the hell mixed reality is. So uh, part of moving into that and understanding how we define it is going to inform how we design the audience experience. And so, here, so here's one. Here's another. And importantly, where's yours? Because depending on who you work with, we all have that perception of what mixed reality is and what it could be. And so that makes it incredibly challenging to design our audience experiences for. But the important thing is to have that intention. And that's why I come back to the caring aspect of this presentation. The important thing is that ultimately we care about our audience. We don't make assumptions as well of the audience in these types of events, in the events that uh, Ian and Justine presented to us. Awesome events, really hard to think of all the aspects of the audience experience, right? Because it's outdoors or it's, it's site specific. Kendra also lots of experience there. Julianne, lots of experience there. Oh my God, there's all these parameters that we have to consider. And my uh, value, if, if anything, with this presentation is to encourage us to do that even more. And in saying that, I also reflect on the practices of uh, emerging technology developers who are obsessed with user experience. Now, it's not the right term for our audiences, right? So I, I've written about this too, and, it, and it, it is a malleable, are they audience, are they user? Oh, I'm watching someone in VR. Wait a minute, who am I right now? Uh, I'm in VR, am I completely immersed in VR? Am I partly in reality? What if I step out and suddenly I hear someone talking behind me? Am I still in, immersed in VR? All of these questions come up. What about augmented reality? What about shared augmented reality experiences? Because that happened a lot, as you'll see in the video coming up. Uh, people sharing augmented reality experiences with other people with their own devices. What about that user experience? Do we consider that when we design our lovelies? So, now after all of the, this is the backstage of what we did, I'll play you the video. <laughs> Credits roll in order for us to see how many people were involved. Oh my God. And thanks to Yangos and uh, colleague Andreas for creating that video for us. Awesome. Uh, you can see all the people involved. This is not really that surprising for us in theater, right? We, you know, we, we tend to know, like, there's tons of people involved. Um, but in mixed reality public events, there's so many variables, there's so many things to consider that we have to be uh, in, in a way, and, and one takeaway from this event is we have to be really, really considerate of all of the people that are involved and be able to say, oh my God, we are also creating a user experience for contributors. So with that, uh, and with this idea of caring and that theme of caring, and uh, th those are some of my takeaways and that's what I wanted to share with all of you today. So, thank you. I know you're on this panel. We're going to transition right into.